Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here and I'm so glad to have our Interstate Council and our keynote speaker, Tim LaSalle, with us. And we're very excited this moment has finally come. I hope you are as well. I hope you've also been enjoying the conference. I am just going to give some housekeeping remarks. We're grateful to all of our sponsors that support the work of NOFA um, year round, as well as specifically for this NOFA summer conference. So um, please appreciate them. I'm sure you already are familiar with many of them and we appreciate their work and they appreciate ours. So we're very grateful to them. We'd like to acknowledge that we are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on this map, assuming you are in the East Coast here. I would like to invite our longtime and outgoing executive director at NOFA, Massachusetts, Julie Rawson, to introduce our keynote speaker. Hi, everybody. Um, and I, I'm happy that we did invite Tim. I've was been hounding Jason for a couple of years, I think, to actually invite Tim to be our keynoter. Um, I first met him, I think when I first met him in 2017 when there was a huge summit in Paris about um, carbon sequestration and climate change. And can you turn off your screen? It's really... Um, and you know what we can do um, from ac across the world to really work on carbon sequestration. Uh, I also saw Tim a couple of times, I think, at the Bionutrient Food Association um, annual conferences, the Soil Nutrition Conferences. And um, he, first of all, struck me if if anybody is as close to having the kind of um, gravitas that. Uh, Wendell Berry has. I, I always thought that Tim was really that kind of person who really um, has got, got that that preacher um, aspect to him that makes him very, very, really fun to listen to. He's had a long, long, long life of being um, in really the right places, the right time to work on all sorts of issues around uh, organic agriculture and not always organic agriculture, but you know, really at this point, really carbon friendly agriculture. And I know that he's a real advocate now for how we can uh, have a kind of agriculture that is carbon sequestering, but also doesn't cost a lot of inputs so that we can make a, an agriculture that's really useful in the third world and places where people don't have a lot of um, opportunity to bring in things to make their food better. So um, Tim is the co-founder of the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and the Director of Outreach and Development and also the adjunct, uh, adjunct professor at the College of Agriculture um, at California State University, Chico. And we're very excited to have him. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure, Julie. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. And it's a delight to be with you all, even though it would be a much bigger delight if we could be together. Uh, I'm speaking to you from California, the opposite coast. My wife and I were really looking forward to traveling back east this summer for this convening to see and revisit a lot of friends and also to visit and look at some of the fine work that I know has gone Uh, on the East Coast in Pennsylvania when I ran, uh, it was also a chance to re first link with NOFA and see the great work that was going on. It strikes me too that um, I most recently on a full-time position have been in Africa with Howard Buffett, spending four years there, but when I came home, I have failed miserably at retirement. So I just must say that uh, I confess to that uh, failure wholeheartedly because the challenges that we all face, and it was mentioned earlier by Jack, uh, particularly with climate change, are real, uh, they're present, and my gosh, there's a solution. So in 2008, I, I had read a, a written a paper, co-written with uh, Dr. Paul Hefferly at Rodeo. We had the data to show we could capture all of our emissions, and that was pretty exciting. There was a tremendous amount of pushback, a lot of pushback from scientists, a lot of pushback from environmentalists, a lot of pushback, I think, because of agendas on it uh, about let's get rid of fossil fuels, which who could argue with that? 
about what different organizations saw as the role, and soil was certainly not on their radar. When I went to Africa, I really went for three reasons. That was we could deal with the issue of climate, yes, and that continent was affected first, and it still is being damaged by climate uh, today, particularly in food production. Second is the issue of hunger. And in, in most of the food insecure in Africa, they are rural, they have land, but it's poor and tired land, and they have no money typically. And the third, of course, is water, and water around the world, which continues to be in great shortage. So let me share my screen now and um, bring up my uh, PowerPoint, if I may. And I'd like to go through some slides with you. Thank you for giving and sharing your time, joining us tonight. And I am putting this title as Regenerative Agriculture, Our Only Possible Future. And so in writing that paper in 2008, it was organic. And I even received some inside pushback from Rodale about using the term regenerative at that time. But I realized is organic sometimes tills and sometimes tills too much, we lose soil and it's not really regenerative in that regard. Conventional agriculture, we can of course all be pretty critical of, but let's not do that at the moment. Let me just say why not organic or agroecological? I sit on the board of directors for Groundswell International, which does work internationally in agroecological uh, efforts and they do fantastic work. But I'm actually trying to work with them even more in a regenerative approach on how we can build those soils much faster than we've thought about in the past. And let's not talk about conventional as a part of this regenerative piece, except we can give credit in this presentation hundred years ago when the farmers in Europe had come to Rudolf Steiner and talked about how tired their land was and just inputs were not creating the kinds of responses in their crops. And he created the agricultural course. And that really was the beginning of looking at how you reinvest in the health and the biology of the soil. Sir Albert Howard, yeah, I'm so I'm happy to see. Screen. Um, are, are you all seeing the screen okay? No, you're not sharing it. It shows, it shows a shared screen here. Um, Jason, how about there? Did you um, click the green button on Zoom to do that? I did this, share. There it is. There it is. Uh, thank you for saying that. So I have many buttons on this Mac and obviously not the right ones. And thank you, you for bringing that up. Slideshow. So I will do that one right now, except it's not being responsive. There it's responsive. Great. Let me just say here that Sir Albert Howard, um, I'm so happy to report now that even Rotan Lal out of Ohio State is quoting Sir Albert Howard. And in making presentations, uh, um, Rattan and I be on the same kind of programs, particularly on the East Coast a lot with regard to carbon capture. And uh, his focus certainly hadn't been there yet, but he's really evolving. And as a carbon expert, it's wonderful to hear him refer to Sir Albert's work. And then of course, we're familiar about the work that began in England and then of course in America with J.I. Rodale. The organic movement is something that I got so engaged in and so excited about, but as I've thought critically about it, I have this but involved in it, and that is it's still less than 1% of the U.S. acreage and globally less than 1.5%. We know we can capture carbon and we can capture it at massive levels, and I'll show you some numbers that are just so encouraging, but if we're only going to work with 1% of the acres, we are all, as I often say, we're toast because we do not solve the climate problem or the climate question. So we have to work with the other 99% of the acres and that's where I've turned my attention is to say, how do we transform those? And how do we get those acres into a carbon capture, soil building, regenerative movement? You know, it says here also, does the organic movement equal food justice? And I only threw that up there because when I used to talk so much and promote organic, um, I would have farmers, conventional farmers stand up and say, yeah, but what about the price of food when it's organic? And that's actually a legitimate criticism that I had a standard answer, but I feel I was not 
at that point. So it is not, as I came back to California, someone grabbed me and pulled me into helping with the California Association of Food Banks because one in four children in the state were food insecure. And I had a lot of contacts still in the state and I could bring some food sources, particularly protein from dairy, from eggs, not so much from meat into that system, but certainly not organic. So not everybody has access to this food that right now is a little more pricey. Well, what about, and you've just talked about on looking at the real organic, what's happened to the standards of the soil? Why have they eroded? And I'm not gonna go into that tonight. Some of you are much better briefed on that anyway, but that's a challenge. Does organic mean healthier soils? We know it doesn't mean that. We know that heavy tillage can destroy the health of the soil as almost as seriously as chemicals. So we, need, we know that we have to do something different there if we have tillage as a primary practice in that process. And it really came down for me to do we have enough time? And that's where we're short. We are really, really short and we've got to get numbers and information that actually matter. And this is a neighboring town of mine about an hour and a half away up in the mountains off the coast between Santa Barbara or Santa Maria and Bakersfield. And I have to tell you that sign makes you stop and think what the hell does 4,663 mean? It's kind of irrelevant. We need numbers that matter and numbers that will begin to affect this. It was odd in 2018, I'm in Georgia, at Will Harris's farm. You know, Will Harris has done a great job with this uh, grazing system and building carbon in the soil. And uh, Jason Roundtree out in Michigan State has done the analysis on that, where that grazing system is carbon sinking. It is not carbon emitting. It's extremely positive stuff. But here comes Hurricane Michael. Had to get out just ahead of the hurricane. And Japan was being hit at the same time. And California was being hit in a very different way. All climate related. Dr. Cindy Daly and I were putting on a Healthy uh, Soils Academy thing from um, Gabe Brown and, and Ray Archuleta uh, in Chico during this Paradise Fire. And we had to wear the N95s because it was hard and uh, psychologically oppressive to not have sun, to have a cloud of carbon laying over the top of you, dark and black. What I always reflect on is where do we have to take this? Where, what is our goal? Where are we trying to get to? And I guess I'm in conflict with your fellow New Englander, Bill McKibben, because he started 350.org. And I just can't look at history and see that there's any sense that 350 works. Well, you know, we're well over 400. The only standpoint of where humanity has lived in a compatible environment with the climate is when it's been about 280 or less. Well, that's really bad news. 350, I think, is a real challenge to whether it could work. Will one and a half or two degrees Celsius work? It looks like not, because that's where we are. And I'm having crop disruptions in California. I saw the damage in Africa. I saw people starving because of climate disruption. So it looks like it's not livable. The good news is we can actually not live with this idea of a sixth extinction, but turn it around. And turn it around means we have to turn our attention to soil as, as, as a whole community of humans on this planet. So when we heard from the UN that we only had 60 years of soil left in 2015, which means that's 55 years now, um, that's a real challenge because that's sort of putting us in that flow of maybe 10 years or less on climate. And both of the solutions to these existential concerns goes back to the soil, which you all remain deeply focused on. But, you know, my friend David Montgomery, who wrote Dirt, the Erosion of Civilization, um, reminded me when I read that book a couple of times, partly while I was sitting in Africa, the upper left-hand corner of the screen was four years, and building in a no-till, no outside input system, a healthy, resilient, biologically focused farming system, but this field was dissed one time and one rainstorm washed that much soil away. That's not only not sustainable, it's certainly not regenerative. 
but it is it fits with we have 60 years left and the upper right is an example my, my wife and i were traveling and doing some work in burundi for our buffett and every square inch of that country was tilled including steep hills and the the Blue Nile starts there and it actually starts to get muddy just a hundred feet down from where the source is because of the tillage. And I would, with some ministers there, I said, what is it that you love about the Egyptians so much? And they looked rather confused. And I said, well, you're giving them your most valuable asset for nothing. And they looked at me more confused. And I said, you're giving them your soil. We must save that and go to a conservation form of agriculture where we're not tilling, where we're keeping the soil covered. In the lower right-hand corner is a neighbor of mine, because in my county here, San Luis Obispo, California, most of the land that's farmed is tilled. In a one rainstorm, this farmer flooded the county road with his soil. And the county, of course, comes and uses a tractor, scoops it up, and hauls it away. So we have a lot to learn. Did we learn it in 1935? Apparently, we did not. And we still have to work on this, pos this position of consciousness, of change, of aggregating this soil back. So on the left uh, of the screen are three samples. And this is my small farm in Atascadero, California. And the center uh, aggregation trial is the soil in my field. And I actually had done a demonstration for 80 rare fruit tree growers, trying to get them to think about their soil differently here locally. And I forgot about this in my barn. And I went back and took a picture 10 days later and it's still aggregated, it's still sitting in that uh, aggregation. The one on the right was a flower bed that we do a little bit of tillage in, but the one on the far left, as you look at it, is across the street where my neighbor discs every year a couple of times to plant oats and no aggregation whatsoever. Erosion, loss of capacity to percolate water. The slide on the, the picture on the right was my fields in Africa. And we had a trainer coming in because Kofi Boa from Ghana and myself and a third person from South Africa would do some training of some seed growers from the continent. And I was doing the biologically um, because we didn't use with Howard Buffett, you didn't use the word organic. So I had the biological no-till. He said, bring some samples from your field. And he'd been in my field. And I thought, you want to do an aggregation test? And he said, yes. And I said, uh, you know that sand? My field is sand. He goes, bring me a sample. And from the field next to it that you saw that was eroded. So the center one, again, I was shocked. It held. It's the clearest water. Um, the field that you saw that had been dissed once and eroded away is the one that's muddy and dissolved. And the one on the right, actually surprising, was undisturbed pasture land. Actually didn't do quite as well as my own farmed fields that were no-till. But the biology, I think, was even a little better. At home in a, here in Atascadero, I can't help myself. I plant these cover crops every winter, let the rain bring them up. I roll them down and walk away from it because I don't want to spend water to farm this few acres but I can't help but capture carbon. And the biomass and the carbon and the biology builds the system. Here's a picture in Ghana, working with Kofi Boa there on some experimental uh, processes that he was doing. The back plot of cowpeas peas that you see there with the, the man in the pink shirt standing next to it um, is a cowpea that was not tilled. And the cowpeas in the front, where my wife's standing next to, are cowpeas, a plot that was tilled. In these two scenarios, you have food security and starvation based on one agricultural practice of tillage or no tillage. Now, we want to build on that, but I want to just use that to talk about soil savings, but biology and ability for aggregation, water percolation, etc. A dear friend of mine who first really got me to think about building soil and, and how fast it could be built was Roland Bunch. And I had met him in Central America in the 80s and Roland showed me soil. He said, you know, we're building this soil at over an inch a year. And he said, there's not a textbook in the world that says we can do that. And that's right. There's not a textbook in the world and scientists will tell you it's not doable. Um, listen to Roland. Don't listen to those scientists. Roland had said, and it was published, that there was a famine rushing towards Africa. 
and he missed this famine by a few months. But he wasn't a weather predictor. He wasn't a climate change predictor. What he was was a loss of soil carbon predictor. And he watched as the soil continued to have the carbon farmed out of it. This starvation came. He said, farmers were reporting, how can we have flash floods and a drought in the same year? And how you accomplish that is to break up your soil aggregation and farm the carbon out of the soil. And you have flash floods and drought in the same year. So Dr. Cindy Daly and I, as we sat down and contemplated, as I got to know her better, we both came from conventional high input, chemicalized, at Chico, I was for 12 years, organic realm, but we knew there, there needed to be more, more about building soil as a focus and as a way to talk to farmers who are not open to the conversation around organic. And we worked on this definition with Tom Newmark, a regenerative agriculture definition, and then 150 companies and individuals. And it says it describes farming and grazing practices that among other benefits reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. So regenerative agriculture involves a lot of things. And you know, Ratan Lal just came out. I was shocked and pleased and sent him a note. And there's a paper he's just released on regenerative agriculture. And he still doesn't yet see the potential for how much carbon we can capture. But I love that he went through as this expert and renowned scientist looking at so many of the practices that can build soil. And I told him I was going to use a quote that he said, because I love hearing this come from him, in red, the strategy is to spare land and resources for nature. Wasting food and polluting the environment are crimes against nature. And I think that as this consciousness rises, I hope and I see it, that we can begin to mobilize around it. You know, for those of you that have taken a lot of beating in the organic world, we're saying organic can't feed the world and you know and I know differently that it can, uh, but regenerative can help it faster. But that's where Howard Buffett and I could have a conversation and where we became friends and I went to work with him in Africa because he said, Tim, go there and show that you can farm with no fertilizers. And I said, I'll give that my best shot. And there's actually history now and studies showing that the Green Revolution in, in India was not real. The whole Norman Borlaug effort was not real. And if you look at the data and you can read those studies, all the other crops increased at the same level as the wheat did. What changed was rainfall. But yet, the whole chemical world has been able to promote the green revolution and to look to invest in another. And Howard was investing in brown revolution. And I said, Howard, I'm in, let's go do it. When I came back, I ran into this guy and this guy started to explain to me why, not that he was sitting and explained to me when I listened to my, that is why my crops performed as well as they did. David Johnson, a micromolecular biologist at New Mexico State, and now we've made an adjunct professor at Chico, really is shifting paradigms from the geochemical understanding of soil to the living biology dominant soil, not a bacterial dominant. And unfortunately, tillage creates more bacterial dominance. He started to teach us that there's quorum sensing organisms that work together to make what the plant needs. The plant sends signals, the organisms get busy when they're signaled for what the needs are because they need each other. And we can self-fertilize, they can self-fertilize the system if we have it robustly, uh, biologically healthy enough. And so from the conversations of a half a ton of carbon per hectare, that most of the data wants to talk about of capturing carbon. David has data that people are rejecting at 10 to 19 tons per hectare, which means we fix this thing rapidly. Well, I don't have a reason to question him yet because so far as we've engaged in replicating his work, now at five major projects we have some funding for at Chico, it's probably gonna show us that, but they're five-year projects and we'll have to show in bigger field scale 
that likely what he's showing us is true, partly because in this crop productivity, the improved photosynthesis efficiency is dramatic, and I didn't even know photosynthesis efficiency could be improved, but it gets improved, and I'll show you a slide on that. The respiration rates of the CO2 out of the soil are declining when you get healthy biology, and you get increased yields, biomass yields, out of these healthy biological soils that surpass rainforests, and it's amazing peace. And so I used to talk about, well, in the organic world, you know, no-till will get us mm, 500 pounds, 300 pounds, something like that per acre. Winter cover crop, 700. Um, actually, out in California, Jeff Mitchell showed 1,000 pounds. But compost we showed at Rodale was 2,000 pounds, and that was the leverage of what we were working off of to say we could start to capture this carbon. Well, one, there's not enough compost in the world to do this. So I appreciate the Marin Carbon Project's work and what John Wick has funded. There's not enough compost to do that. Managed grazing out of Georgia said, boy, they could get about 8,000. And that finally plateaued, but boy, did they capture a lot of carbon in that six to eight years as they grazed differently. And David's work, as you see, is off these charts as a whole new paradigm to look at what we might do when we look at the biology in a very different way. So David Johnson and his wife, Wei Chin, have developed this aerobic bioreactor, and they're being built now all over the world. Um, my wife and I were recently speaking in, in Rwanda, and we, we ran over to Kenya because there was a research facility that said, we, we're, we teach conservation ag, we don't want to be left behind in the biology, come see what we do. Reactor. What it is an aerobic process, it do not turn it. It's at least 12 months in maturing and it develops a fungal dominance. And I want to show this as the metagenomic analysis that David did, one of his slides, showing not that you have to identify all these different bacteria and organisms in a system, and that, but after four weeks, this was the dispersion of and predominance of different organisms sitting within that aerobic compost. But when you get to 22 weeks, you see the change and the increase in numbers of species that show some significance of participation in what's going on in that living system. And at 60 weeks, you see a great, great increase with 740 species that are in the top 80%, oh, top 80% is 99 species. But it appears that this is what's crucial. I used to call David and said, hey, I got my bioreactor going now. Now what's in it? What am I looking for? And he would often, as a systems thinker, remind me that I claim to be a systems thinker, everything's in it, Tim. It's not about bottling up a few bugs and putting them in your soil. It's about hosting the array of all of them. And nature self-organizes. Nature, the plants, the roots, they call out and signal what they need. The organisms rally and bring it to the plant. So that fungal network is crucial. We know that mycorrhizal fungi will, the, the carbon sheath on that can last in the soil to up, a thousand, up to a thousand years. That's carbon capture. It also knows that it is the highway system. It demineralizes and brings phosphorus, et cetera, to the plant, as well as nitrogen, it will bring it. We know that the root exudates, that that plant is continually feeding the organisms in this system, so that it, in its collaboration, it's dumping carbon sugars, carbohydrates into the soil, and feeding those organisms so that they can work together. And now James White, who some of you may know at Rutgers, and I've watched his video and it's wonderful to see, but it's talking about the rhizophagy of, of plants, which is like, plants eat bacteria? I mean, we didn't really think about that before. And most of the soil scientists and the geochemical thinking are not thinking this way. But for that plant root to have basically a wallless protoplast that can take in these organisms, digest some of them, use the nutrients, and then re-emit a number of the organisms back out to continue to reproduce and keep this cycle going, we know how it is now much better that plants in healthy soils can produce their own fertility in collaboration with the life of the soil. It's pretty exciting. When David went to some cotton fields, he just in one and a half years of applying only the biological 
versus the normal 150 pounds of nitrogen applied, he more than doubled the yield. He did this cotton finding on a seven-year-old plot that he had only inoculated once at the beginning, kept a live root in it all the time. When he pulled a crop out, he put a cover crop in, and he just kept going. He did grow cotton and he got five and a half bales, whereas normal yield in the area is two and a half with the full suite of fertilizers. In my work in South Africa, the, I was showing no-till, I was showing no outside inputs, it was all biological. The only thing I purchased was seed. And so most smallholder farmers, you know, struggle to have cash at all, let alone send their kids to school with school fees. So I was looking for ways that they could actually produce more food, build their soil. And this worked exceptionally well. Was farming nutrient deficient soils, particularly in phosphorus, no nitrogen outside uh, sources, and the yields jumped over five times what the local harvest were. This is where I resonated with what David was talking about, because I had no way to explain. If you look at a lot of the scientists that, that want to bash Gabe Brown saying, you know what, he doesn't have enough can't be sequestering that much, long because of what these organisms can do. It shows, and I'll show you some data that I think proves that. But Lane Ingham showed that when you're in bare, in bare soil or in where we get a lot of weeds, and you know weeds are challenged always, but tillage, bacterial dominant soils host weeds. When we get up in this range here to where the fungal to bacterial, F colon B, fungal to bacterial, ratio gets to one to one. That's where we get into very productive row crop production. And when you get up to like a thousand to one fungal to bacteria, you're in ancient forests. Those are old growth forests. But then, and we don't want to farm those. We want to farm our farmland, but we want that healthy soil to get there. What David found on the left side of these graphs, you're going to see where his um, potting soil, this was in a greenhouse, he put his, his fungal dominant inoculant. And that was compared to What's interesting why I show this is he found the correlation of nitrogen found in those in those um, uh, plant and those plant soils. There was no correlation between the amount of nitrogen and the plant mass. None. Now that goes against our training. When he looked at phosphorus, there was still no correlation. It came back to the biology. When he went to potassium, again, no correlation. So certainly the amount of organic matter, because we teach that so much, we should see some correlation. But again, it was pretty low. What was pretty interesting though, fungal to bacterial ratio in that soil showed a very positive correlation to plant mass plus plant yield versus the other elements that we normally test our soil for. So that's an exciting thing of why Dr. Daly and I have joined with David to try and replicate his work as fast and as quickly as we can, because we think it can help transition farmers extremely rapidly. This is a complex slide, but I only want to say that when the fungal to bacterial ratio is very low, the amount of, of plant and fruit and fruit is the, you know the red zone here uh, it, it, there's no to that when the soils are poor but when the soils get bacterial ratios high you start to get a lot of yield and a lot of yield also in carbon capture but here's what i think is pretty interesting too is respiration so a lot of people that want to be critical of Johnson's work and saying, well, you know, you get this going and get all the life going, you're going to have more respiration. But actually what happens is the fungal communities increase the soil carbon respiration as a percent of the initial soil carbon declines from over 50% to 10%, which means you may have more total respiration, but you're losing a heck of a lot less carbon and you're building the carbon and the health of your soil much faster to a healthy biological system that's fungal dominant. Now that's exciting because we can all do this on our farms and we can do it, make it ourselves, and it costs 
oh, about 25 cents an acre to produce. So it's very affordable. It just takes the time and patience in doing it right. When he finally, this was the first year when he just applied this to some cover crops, he saw this five times gain in grams per square meter of, of biomass. By the end, he got 3,200 grams per square meter in the biological system. And so what that means is, is that in comparison to long-term no-till or agroecological systems or arable cropping systems where they were measuring carbon and um, that beam certainly outmatches this beam is because it's the biology plus managing with cover crops and keeping live roots in a system and doing no-till the best you can do no-till. So that's where we can see some rapid gains. Is that just crazy, you know, um, field plots at a university or in a greenhouse? Well, David went and looked at Gabe Brown, who of course takes a lot of hits and looked at his carbon capture numbers and they matched identical. But if you look at Gabe's numbers, they didn't take off till he really integrated livestock at the end, which brought, I mean, the multi-species cover crop helped a lot, but then the livestock brought that soil biological inoculation and they took off to match the same rates that David had. This encourages us to continue this research and say, my gosh, here's a real life experience. Jason Roundtree and, and others are looking at Gabe's numbers uh, and going to get some summaries out on that. Uh, John Norman's part of that. And then we're going to continue to work with David's work. You know, the multi-species is really an important part as far as feeding the different niches of biology in the soil. So when we do cover cropping or sometimes even interseeding in our crops, it's an important piece. You know, creation is incredibly diverse and biodiversity is really a future for us and monoculture is really a problem. Christine Jones shared this slide with me. I asked her for it specifically because this was in Canada in a rain short year. And on the left, the, the, for, the front of that field is triticale uh, in a rain short year. On the right is triticale planted in a multi-species cover crop right next to it. Same field, same rainfall. You actually are gonna have a crop if you're trying to harvest that. You're gonna have a lot of forage. But what happens is, is they, these plants work together. The biology begins to work together different plants feed different biology, the fungal communities get more active, and diversity is the way of building health and resilience into a system. So we know some principles, we know some potential, we know that we could fix the climate problem, we can also fix other problems for farmers with a real regenerative approach, but how do we get them to adopt? How do we get them to change? Well, those of us who love the organic movement know that's a tough nut to crack. You all are, are, are innovators. You all who are involved in this are people who understand the danger of chemicals and want clean food and want healthy soil. But a lot of people are just trying to make a living or they have a tradition or they have a university training or they have peer pressure, et cetera, and they're not going to change. I did some work about four years ago in, in India and in Nepal, basically because the, of the glacier melts and the loss of water savings and I was trying to get a little more in one Kaya, which was really up at 10,000 feet and they took me up to their glacier which was basically almost gone and they knew that was their water source and the farmers knew they had to change you know may we get with this before these millions of farmers around the world are, who are going to be affected by glacier loss of water sources so that we can actually continue to feed the world. But what's the best currency for mass, mass, uh, mass adoption? Is it currency? I mean, you know, I, I, this picture was actually in my backyard, but I really don't think money grows on trees out here. But I just want to say that, you know, I think that we do have to think in terms of what helps change people with regard to making the kinds of changes that will create healthy soils, regenerate their soils, pull that carbon out of the atmosphere, and start to move the toxins out of the system. Well, the barriers, of course, one are peer pressure. And I know I was working with uh, 
Aaron Stevens at, at Nature's Path back when, and he said he had a farmer that had, was in his second year of transition to organic grain up in Canada, and he called and said he was quitting, and, and they said, why? And he said, well, some of my buddies saw weeds in my field, and I'm not going to be embarrassed by that. Peer pressure is real, and we have to be able to deal with that. You know, often our training and our competencies get in the way of change because we may be very competent at a high input system and our training taught us to do that. And all of us, you know, organic folk are just simply those kind of left coasters as they call us out here or you East coasters who are focused on this natural kind of stuff. Well, the Midwest sometimes is harder to have these conversations, but I also say with scientists, often their training gets in the way of them being able to see a whole system solution because they're only looking at it through one lens, how they were trained, and they can't see it in another way. And that's for me not being as a trained PhD in soil science, I think has served me as a great advantage. I wasn't restricted by how I was supposed to respond or what language I was supposed to use, but rather I could begin to observe, pay attention, and have an inquisitive mind. The other thing, of course, is fear of failure, and that could be loss of your farm. So well, we have to respect that. And psychological, actually, that's where my PhD is in, is in depth psychology, as Julie knows. And you know, we could go on about that a lot, about the, the parts of us in our egos that have now merged with our consciousness, and we think that our thoughts and our beliefs define us. And so if you attack my belief, you're attacking me. And that's and why it is where such times are a bigger issue of prejudice and bias than even race in this country. So what is the language that is needed? How do we de-escalate a sense of division and divisiveness? How do we inspire a conversation and inspire change? And can we provide incentives to do that? You know, in Africa, when my fields were showing this kind of corn yield, it looked about the same as all the other farms that were there, uh, on the farm. Uh, Howard had 9,000 acres. There were four other universities and myself all doing our own work. They were using all the chemicals and um, they'd look at mine and scratch their heads. But uh, Doug Aller, who's up in the right hand corner, runs uh, Howard's Farm in Arizona. And after our first year trial with them on corn, and I'll show you that data at the end of this program, he comes out with two ears of corn, one from our biologically treated plots and one from his full fertilizer. And he couldn't see a difference. And he said, why am I buying fertilizer? And that's the question we'd like them to come to, because change often has to come from a self-revelation, a self-discovery going, oh my goodness. So here's a piece, we'll soon be releasing a paper that David Johnson um, is authoring for us for primarily with respect to that. After the first year, some of the data was so strong, uh, we weren't gonna publish anything till year five, but my gosh, let's take a look at this. The corn volume in the first year where we had the conventional treatment with 217 bushels, where we inoculated the seed with that bioreactor inoculant plus 15% of the normal fertilizer, we had actually a tiny bit more corn, and where we had no fertilizer whatsoever, just the biology, we were about 6% less. Now I'm going to tell you this field, this is going to hurt for organic people to listen to, this field had herbicides used on it and it was sprayed. But I have a, a really, for, for Mike, I have a really good piece to report to you on that. At the end of the season is, twice for mites. This year he only had to spray one dat, which we didn't set into our research design, which we should have. When we looked at reed, weed pressure after this first year, there was weeds in the biologically treated areas. So even though there were anti, the biology was surviving, not as well as I believe it could if there were none used, but it was performing exceptionally well. Let's go down then to what I think is one of the most mm, challenging things where we get 
the bile at the bottom, biologically nitrogen fixed, pounds per acre of nitrogen fixed, in the conventional system that was fertilized, 126 pounds were lost to the environment, nitrous oxide, uh, uh, leaching, et cetera. Where there was beam or the biologically enhanced in 15%, 79 pounds were made and created, and where there was just biology, 107. Now remember, all three of these had cover crops before, all treated the same. So we can't say that 107 pounds came from the cover crops, it came from the biology. And this is actually how I got the conversation to go with Howard Buffett is to say, you know what? You're interested in corn that fixes nitrogen that comes out of Central America, but that's eight month corn. It only fixes 50%. I think we can show you we can fix all of it. And so far, we're still having conversations with Howard because here we're fixing the nitrogen without adding it. What does that do to profit? And that comes back to that money. Is that a currency of conversion? We know it is for lots of farmers who are going to be hard pressed as corn prices drop. And here is where you see the best margin increased revenue came out of the bean plus 15% in this first year. And I will lay money on the table that by year five, we will show the most coming out of just the biologically enhanced because we'll be building the robustness of the biology over these five years and we'll see a response improve. We'll see water percolation improve. We'll see aggregation of soil improve. We'll see weed pressure decline and insect pressure decline. And that I'll put a wager on because we've seen how responsive the plant is when that soil gets healthy biologically. You know, we've degraded Mother Earth through tillage and chemicals and monocultures, but we can robustly regenerate life if we work with her. And that's the kind of thing that I think is really the really exciting part to us is knowing that we can start to cover bare land, which radiates heat and also is warming this planet, and we can cool her down. In this case, it was just with grazing. It was grazing in a different way and managing that soil and having reverence for that in a different way. It's the kind of thing too that I think when we think in terms of the numbers that David shows us, if we could just get the majority of land, and it's why we've dedicated our lives to working with that 99% of the acres, because we need them, we need them desperately, we can take these carbon levels back down. And then we know in dealing with them, language matters. So I don't knock on a door and say the word, the O word to most farmers. I don't knock on the door and say, get rid of your chemicals to most farmers. And knock on the door and say, can we help you build your soil and increase your resiliency of your farm. And you know what, like Gay Brown, who never started out to be an organic grower and he's not certified and, and won't be, but he said, I've gotten rid of all my chemicals. And why? Not motivated by philosophy, not motivated by a belief in that directly, motivated by need, financial need. And that's where I think we need to be headed. And I think we need to be headed in an open-hearted way, in a way that helps us communicate to everyone because we need everyone involved. And John Lewis was about radical love. And he said, I believe that you see something that you want to get done, you cannot give up and you cannot give in. And that's in essence what I think all, all of us are here about today, is not giving up and not giving in, as tough sometimes as farming is, as tough sometimes as the markets are, and as tough sometimes as actual perceptions are, we have to stay with it. But I think we have to stay with it in a communication style that's open, that's accepting, that's meeting people where they are and not preaching, but leading them and letting them self-reveal to themselves actually what matters. So I really would love to open it to some questions if we have time, Jason. I would love to be able to respond if we can and I leave you here with my email, but also at Chico State, which we have a tremendous number of resources. We've started on our website that's listed there. And we have started with uh, Tomcat Ranch, Tom Steyer and his wife, Cat Taylor's Ranch, a regenerative agriculture network. We're trying to talk about the scientific gaps, bringing farmers into the conversation and bringing industry into the conversation because so much of the food industry knows they have to meet their carbon budgets and they have to reduce their carbon impact 
and they're looking for regeneratively produced food that is actually going to help them meet their carbon budgets. So with that, let me unshare and um, come back. And Jason? Yes, thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat um, that I want to bring to you, kind of a statement, but also a question here uh, from Lenore. Since old forests are fungal dominant, plus other eco services, wouldn't agroforestry and food forest gardens be an essential strategy for eco ecosystem restoration and climate resilience and healing? Agroforestry is a wonderful, wonderful effort, and it um, can do lots of things. Uh, it doesn't end up being as cropping systems and some farmers' environment. Sort of like people would say, "What about permaculture? Permaculture is fantastic," but I don't promote permaculture because if I think in terms of the smallholder farmer in Africa to bring a system that complex to them is, uh, is the resource level we don't have. I need to bring, we need to bring, we need to share the simplest, most robust systems that will work as fast as we can. Remember, we have a very few years left to turn this climate thing around. And agroforestry is fantastic, but to hold that up as, let's all get agroforestry going, I think is not in a, in a time frame not fast enough for us. If you're interested in it, if you can help spread it, please do it. It's very powerful. Um, it's not something that, that we're going to spend the time to promote that one thing. Because if I'm going to talk to a, a, a corn grower in Iowa, that's not going to be a conversation that probably is going to go anywhere. But I can get a conversation of we can save you money and build your carbon in your soil, the health of the soil very fast. And that's a conversation that can still go somewhere. Uh, and then maybe we'll have time to have these long-term, more complex des desires to fix the environment in the way we know it should be fixed. Thank you. Another one here. You mentioned inoculating with the bioreactor fungal compost. Can you explain that more? Yes, please go to the website too. And, and David shows some way. And what we're finding in our practice and in our research is one of the best ways to inoculate it is if there's a way. Now we're actually in our cedars, on our farm scale cedars, we're going out and finding ways to retrofit those cedars so that uh, we can have a spray injector. So some of them come with spray injectors to spray liquid fertilizer. Well, we don't wanna do that. We wanna spray the organisms, the extract of the organism. So all you do is you pull some of that compost out and it takes in general, about a pound or two pounds of that product per acre, but you stir it up very vigorously in water, intense biology, fungal dominant biology, and then hopefully spray it on your seed while you plant. That would be the most effective because when that seed then the organisms and the root hairs get to work right away. And then it grows, that whole thing grows. And if you can do it in a winter cover crop, you're kind of covering all the land. So if you're doing certain row crops, this will cover all of your soil. And I would do it every year for a while until it's really, really productive. If all you can do is, is you know, spread it dry, um, so to speak, um, then do that. Uh, you can make a paste with molasses and milk. And, you know, there you got and it never wants to come off your thumb when you're trying to push it in the ground. But hey, there's ways to get it inoculated at home. And I think the cedar method with the injector is what's proven to be most effective. And it's a little more costly, but if you're a bigger farmer, it'll work very well. Um, there's another one here. <clears throat> it might've been answered, I'm not sure, but uh, is the key to establishing the high fungal ratios the David Johnson bioreactor? It is. So what happens, that's an aerobic no-turn system. Instead of our normal composting that we did, that's anaerobic high turn. 
So, you know, every time you turn a compost, you're breaking up the fungal communities. And, and we, when you go anaerobic, you're not supporting the fungal communities because those high temperature, high moisture, um, sort of interiorly a lot less air systems um, do not support that fungal growth as well. Not that you won't get some fungal growth, but there's lots of different kinds of fungus. And this aerobic system seems to bring a high array of fungal communities, but a, a number of ones that are needed for good soil that you're going to make through this process um, that has air pockets, you know, 78% of, of the air is nitrogen. You want to capture that. So you want good aggregated soil with air that will move through it and water that will percolate through it. Um, the, those fungal communities will be in that compost that's aerobically made and in a no-turn environment. Um, Russ asks, so how would I start practicing BEAM? So again, go on our website and there's, there's, I would really encourage you to watch a, a whole hour and a half presentation from David Johnson. And if you go to, to resources and then to seminars and scroll down through different speakers there, he's on there. He'll talk to you about the whole thing. There are also landing sites in that web that will show you how to build the bioreactor. And I have, because of my work in Africa and just being there, I keep thinking, how do we make a small scale one for a gardener or a small scale farmer that only has a few acres or um, for these African farmers? And I've made a small one and it's seven months into it. And I'm anxious to test it after it's supposedly fully matured and see if it succeeded. Because if so, then we're gonna put that up too and say, you know, when David started this, it was just an experiment. And the beautiful thing about David Johnson, I love him as a scientist. He didn't throw the hypothesis up. He was doing research for something else, but he started noticing and observing responses. And he goes, what's that about? And so he started to follow it. And that's how he started to uncover so much of this. And so we're trying to observe too, as we're going through and learn what works best. Um, we're trying to learn how you can test You know, you actually have this in that end product. And we're all of those questions to help everybody be able to engage this. So we have bioreactor makers, as I said, on every continent except Antarctica. I don't know why those penguins won't cooperate, but everybody else we're seeing in Australia and in Africa and Asia and Europe, we see these bioreactors being made. And it's exciting, and, and we'd love to hear their results and, and how they're faring with it as well. Um, besides Chico State, what are some other leading universities doing this research? Uh, good question. So, um, whole systems research is typically not done. Richard Teague at Texas A&M has done that with regard to grazing. Jason Roundtree at Michigan State. There's a few others out there, but we're the first, you know, I left the university in 1986 as a full professor and I walked out the door because I knew I had more to do. I never aspired to get back involved in the university, but I'm there because it ain't happening there. As I, again, scientists are rewarded within their discipline, within their expertise, within their journal societies. And we're actually trying to create a journal for regenerative agriculture and get these system thinking scientists inspired and giving them a place to have conversations and publish their work uh, and get it peer reviewed by people who can think in systems ways. But to our, our knowledge so far, we're, we're the only center of regenerative agriculture at a university. I think part of the reason we were able to do it at Chico is not only because Cindy Daly is there, but because, and we have a number of faculty that have joined us from that campus, but because there was not industry investment at that campus. And so there's no real back push, uh, as you know, that happens in many campuses where outside interest would rather not see this work go forward. Um, so we're kind of, you know, we have a lot of pressure, but we're working pretty hard and things, um, we've gotten some pretty good support, not state or not federal, but we've gotten some pretty good support and onward we go. Great. Um, there's a bunch of um, questions coming through. I'm not sure if we can get to them all, but um, I'm going to try the uh, practical ones, I suppose. Um, 
Is there a special technique required to inoculate with high fungal compost with fracturing the hyphae? No. A lot of what's happening, and, and when you do the extracting, a lot of what you're going to be, at that point, it's a mature situation, and a lot of the fungal communities have sporated, and so you're putting the spores on the, on the seed is what you're doing. So you're not disturbing that until the, the 12th month or 13th month. Um, what materials go into the bioreactor? Is it manure, plant waste, food waste? Yes, 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 yes. Carbon. So leaves, manure, uh, you know, uh, stuff that comes out of your field, cardboard. You, you can put in most anything. And I started with what David started with, which was um, I had horse manure because my neighbor piles it on my place. We let them and then we compost it. But I had horse manure, a third, and then I put a third leaves and I put a third wood chips. And uh, he had cow manure, which I think from a ruminant would be better. But David's even now acknowledged he can do 100% leaves. And he, when he look, looks at the metagenomics of it, at the end of that 13 months, it's not really different than having the manure in the system too. Remember all these organisms live in the atmosphere and they all live around us, they're all over us. And so you're gonna get it fairly well inoculated. But if I had my preference, I'd love a ruminants manure. You know, I'd love some wood chips just cause you, you love to see how that hosts certain fungus. And, and I'd love leaf matter or, you know, you want to, you wanna be sure it's well mixed so that there's air that can move through, you know, if you do a bunch of tree leaves together, how they with moisture will stick together and you won't get movement. David also throws worms in, which I think is important. Um, red worms, because they'll cut through and break through that aerate. And I also think they bring additional biology into the system that helps. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, any further insights from deep psychology on how we can, how we change with relationship to individuals and also with the zeitgeist? Thank you. Well, here's part of our challenge as humans is that, that we have this unconscious realm of ourselves where we buried a lot of what we don't like about ourselves and unconsciously we project it onto others. So what we're spending our time doing is pointing at those bad people over there and I'm doing this right because it's hard to admit our flaws, our errors, our dark side in essence, and it's easy to see it in others. So from a depth realm, this is not behavioral realm, from a depth realm, it's important to acknowledge as humans, we all have these hidden parts and we all start as a child to bury them. It lives inside of us and we have a tendency unconsciously to project on others. This is where I think John Lewis talks about radical love. How do we accept each other? And knowing that if somebody's identity says, you organic guys, you're trying to kill us. We're trying to live. You guys not get reactive and try and understand that person from where they come from. How do you help them in a communication standpoint? Again, coming from a standpoint of having compassion for our fears, for our psychological defenses to defend against things that we really can't even communicate or understand well. I was just listening to a depth psychologist on the seminar recently who was talking about the COVID virus right now and the fear it brings forward on an unconscious level is tapping into some of the trauma and fear that maybe happened to us pre-verbally so we're trying to defend against it the best we can by denial. And we know people that are denying the virus. And actually we, we ran into one of our friends that visited um, a colleague that he'd known. This guy's a lawyer and he visited a judge that he'd known. And of course the judge is a bright guy. And they got into conversation and, and when it came to COVID, the judge said, oh, that's a hoax. And you think in terms, how can someone that intelligent deny the COVID virus. But if you go and look at it from a depth standpoint, whatever his trauma, whatever his suffers, his defense is to push it away. It's a defense is to deny. So when we think we can convince people with data, when we can convince people with 
what's right. That's not typically a communication point or language that can access something that maybe they are defending against something early on in an identity, in a, heart, in a trauma, in a like or dislike that remains on an unconscious level. And all arguments with data are on a conscious level. So we have to access from a different point. And recall, this is an amazing thing. 80% of our decisions are made unconsciously. And you're going, what? No, I think about it. No, you've already made the decision and you've rationalized that decision based upon your unconscious desire to pull that off. So that's where depth comes into the realm of knowing. In our work with each other, we need to be as respectful as we can, as open. And how do we build bridges? And then how do we help all of us restore this planet? Thank you. A um, couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. So I have two here. Uh, first one, it doesn't matter if you use hardwood chips versus pine. Yes, you'll get along all right with pine, uh, but you'll find, uh, you know, on this coast, eucalyptus I want to stay away from. I want to stay away from pine. Uh, it's better to go on hardwood if you have it or, or white, another kind of white wood, but not so much pine with the oils or eucalyptus with the oils. Right. Um, Al asks, David Johnson lives in dry New Mexico and recommends watering bioreactor daily. In the humid Northeast with more rainfall, how important would you say watering is? So, you know, this is an unknown for us, and this is research we would love to have time to do, et cetera. It's important not for you when you get so much rainfall and humidity, David Johnson is in Las Cruces, and uh, that's definitely dry. He does water it every day. His point is 70% moisture is what he's looking for to maintain it at. And so having good drainage is important. Sometimes when it's very wet, people put it under a roof and then water it. But it's a matter, I think, of just being sure that it doesn't dry out and to keep it moist. Keep it, if you can, at about 70%, which means if you water it on the top, let it drain through, you're probably in that 70% range. Fantastic. Thank you very much for answering all those questions. It's my pleasure. Thank you all for your interest. And I just you know, want to summarize by saying that um, I have kind of come to a conclusion at this stage of life. Uh, no more arguments, no more fights. How do we make build bridges? How do we have communication? How do we restore the planet and help every community on this planet the best we can? And we know that Earth needs reinvestment because we have taken from her and we have not given back. Gee, now we know the way and we know a way through soil. And thank you all of you for your passion for soil. It's a pleasure to visit with you. I'm always most comfortable in these groups and it's been a delight to be with you. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Nofa, for inviting me. Our pleasure. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, there's much appreciation coming in the chat as well. And that uh, concludes our keynote session here, everyone, and um, concludes our adult portion of the NOFA Summer Conference. Uh, we appreciate everyone for coming, and you as well, Tim. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you and to have you here tonight. Um, I wish you the best and hope to stay in touch. Thank you very much. Good night.